put a new battery on that. Mm -hmm. It could be. Can you see the battery? Um, that's going. All right, so in case the sound wasn't going when I was talking before, I'm going to do my 500 elbows and shadow boxing. Um, so you're totally welcome to join in, ask questions, say things, like whatever. It's very informal as I'm doing this. So I'm actually going to work on the blocks. It's my, my sudden change. I'm just going to work on relaxed high blocks. There was a talk yesterday when I was doing my live stream. Shay asked a question about my block, how mine seems to come straight up, but he's seen my trainers kind of like swings up um, and is a little bit more like open than mine. I was looking at every impressive photo I have of a block. There are a lot of photos of me blocking that I used to get um, embarrassed about because I'm basically just getting kicked in these like magazine photos. And then someone pointed out to me, <laughs> They're giving you their best kick. It's like a poster kick, and you're like, nope, like try again, just like blocking kind of thing. So my excellent blocks in all of my photos tend to be super high and just kind of, I look a little bit more stressed than I'd like to, but that's life. It's just a super like comes up almost into my um, shoulder, which is something that Master K taught me. Uh, was a, a way to warm up was actually just to literally hit your own shoulders like that. So I'm trying to like feel that high block, because that's what I'm not thinking about in fights, but I'm effectively blocking people out with. So just practicing that relaxation and height so that it comes up really easily, like right out of my footwork and stance. It's basically what I'm trying to feel. And I'm very much on my toes right now. When I actually fight, I'm not as much on my toes. So I'm trying to also be a little bit realistic. I fight people so much bigger that when I get kicked, I can't be all the way up on my toe for a block. I get like knocked off. So when I throw up my block, I want to have a little bit of stability in my standing leg. And I just want it to come up really naturally and easily. And I'm trying to block on this side a lot because <laughs> one, that's my open side, but two, Yod Kung Pan is always like, you lose to southpaw because I block really fast on this side. I'm very, very fast with my left block, but my right one, a little bit less so. I think because I tend to blade up like this. These are my thoughts. I think that I stand too much like this. And so there's a much bigger, like, gotta drag that leg up. Whereas, especially when you're facing a southpaw, if you stand a little bit more 
squared up. Um, Susan Corn told me this, when you face a southpaw, you just want to bring this foot a little bit more far up than you normally would facing orthodox, probably because you're going to be checking that side so much because that's your open side. So I try to stay a little bit more square and I throw that block up very often in order to kind of like wear that groove. Feels good though, it feels relaxed. Hi Chris, good morning from New York. Helen's watching, hi Helen. Amaya's, hello. Michael Clark, hello. Left our arm bar Rhonda, I know you, your name's up all the time. Kristen, hello. Cool. Hi everyone, thanks for joining me. I'm gonna get back into my elbows. So with my elbows, it's actually exactly the opposite as my blocks. <laughs> on my blocks, I'm up on my toes really, really nice, and I'm trying to be more realistic and bringing my heel down to have like more stability. And then on my elbows, I'm actually super grounded, and I'm trying to like bend my knees and come up on my toes a little bit more to get the flexibility and my twist with it not coming from my feet, but actually coming from my knees and my waist like that. So. It's like playing with the levels on a soundboard. <laughs> I have to like scoot it up on my elbows and then scoot it down on my uh, blocks. It's interesting. <laughs> idea of doing elbows and blocks. <laughs> it's like that as a system working together is just I block and I elbow. Like none of your high scoring fancy femur kicks are gonna land and I'm just gonna throw a lot of elbows. That'd be a fun fight actually. basically want to feel like I could do these blocks all day. Like, it's the same way that, I think it was Ali or Tyson or someone, probably Ali said that when he's doing sit-ups, when they start to hurt, that's when he starts counting. It's basically, I want to be already tired in my hips. And then all of the blocks I do after my legs are tired, those are the ones that really count. So it's getting to the point of tension and then getting past the point of tension to relaxation again that matters. If I start relaxed, that's fine. Anyone can be relaxed in the first five minutes of something. It's under pressure or under fatigue that that relaxation matters. So just trying to get to a point where I can feel the like, I don't know, resistance in my body of like not wanting to be relaxed. Like when it starts to feel like I'm forcing my leg up, that's when those start to really matter. Michael. I think my foot's doing really good actually. It's uh, I'm really just feeling around with it. I'm like trying to figure out what I can do to make it better and then things that I can do to less aggravate it and things like that. But it's really just like a, a feeling out process. But I'm very optimistic about what state my foot is at right now actually. I'm practicing pulling back a little bit to avoid having to actually stop. Like, when I have to actually stop, then I'm in trouble, because then I have to like 
rest it and stay away from the things that I really want to be doing. So if I just pull back a little bit and like edge on the things that I really want to be doing, then I don't quite, don't quite have to put on the brake. I did the voiceover for True Thailand today and I really liked it. I was like super excited for this next session with him that's going to be in the Muay Thai library. We have one with him before and then this new one he's working with me on like lots of turns and clinch holds and things like this. But near the end of it, like in the final quarter or something, he starts showing these elbows and he and Yod Kun Pan actually were at the same gym for a short time. I totally forgot that Yod Kun Pan was at Pinson Chai. They bought his contract late in his career. But Crew Thailand is basically doing, I can't do it. He's basically doing this with his arms, but then he's throwing elbows at the same time. I think it's actually the opposite. I think he's elbowing here, and then the one that goes above is the one that's blocking. So he's got this total like rotation thing going. But when he does it, it's so beautiful. And when you when you watch this session, maybe we should even just excerpt this part because it's so amazing. But he's like he's doing this total thing like this that's completely symmetrical and beautiful and relaxed with his elbows and then his feet are just doing this so it's just so it's like watching a machine but not soulless <laughs> it's, like, it's like a beautiful um i don't know like when you see the inner workings of a clock like how how beautifully designed that is i want to get that on my movements where you can like see how practiced they are but they don't look practiced through like effort But in Thai, they call it tamatat. Tamatat means nature or like instinct. But basically, like people are always trying to get the right technique. And they're like, oh, how do I, how do I get, oh, like the perfect thing? And your training is like tamatat, tamatat. Like you take, you take the technique and you take the thing that you're learning, and then you make it yours because anything that passes through your hands gets your fingerprints all over it. And so they're like, put your fingerprints on it. Like it shouldn't look. When you do it, it shouldn't look exactly the same as when your trainer did it. Because you're different people. But people who have done things like a gazillion times, when I say that it looks like a clock or mechanical or something, it's because it's just so, like, efficient. very nice word for it because in fluidity like everything just moves together I was talking about my friend Cho a while ago I think like maybe five or six sessions ago I was talking about my friend Cho Cho Shen Schneider he taught um, popping and locking in our high school and he was so good man like he had this style that he had probably taken from somewhere else in terms of influence but he made it so cool he called it flip book so it was like kind of it was a little bit more fluid than than just popping would be but he looked like a flip book like he just did these like movements that were completely insane it looked like you were looking at a 
flip book or like like um, slow cinema or something. Um, it was totally this like the articulation of each little beat, but they flowed together really nice. I really like the differences between popping and locking where you're like hitting something really hard where you're like, oh yeah, each one of those is just so like articulated and punctuated. And then you've got the liquid where you've got like people who are just moving and it's just like so fluid and you're like, how are they so Gumby-like? But I love that those two contrast with each other but are kind of in the same set of style, like they're styles within a greater style. And I think you see that with a lot of fighters, like um, Thailand, Drew Thailand, who I was voicing today, he calls himself Moi Bok. People are becoming more familiar with like Moi Khao, Moi Fimur, uh, Moi Te is kind of a thing, and then like Moi Mat, it's a puncher. Something that people are less familiar with is Moi Bok. Moi Bok means that you're always pressing forward and you're just like, you are the first to be firing your weapons. It's very intense, but it's not like, it's not brawly and it's not rushing forward. It's cool that he identifies himself as Moi Bok because what weapons he's actually using when he's throwing all of those things and like coming forward is um, you can pick him out and you can like put him in that classification because he likes to throw a lot of hands or something like that but it's the same thing of like if you're looking at people who are doing um, you know hip-hop dancing or something and they have like this particular the way they punctuate something or the way that they don't punctuate something like defines their style that's what I like so much about these fighters is that there are some fighters who are like super punctuated in everything they're doing and then there's some that just like melt, like Karahat just melts <laughs> away from everything, but it all like flows and oozes together. And then you have someone like, um, I don't know, maybe Krupat. Krupat is just like every single thing that he throws is like bong, bong, bong. Like you see like with distinction each thing that he's throwing. The thing that uh, Crew Thailand was saying about Yod Kun Pan when he was talking about how they were gym mates, he imitated him for a second. I love when fighters imitate other fighters. He was showing like all these elbows, just like endless elbows, and then bong, like the last one that comes on top. It was so Yodkun Pan. This like you have this barrage of elbows that you're just overwhelmed by, and then it's that last one that's just like, and that's the one I've actually been setting up for this entire time. My insulating cup is not keeping my water very cold. That's <laughs> the point. So someone asked me yesterday whether I visualize when I'm shadow boxing, like if I visualize an opponent. Yes. When you're blocking, all I'm doing is blocking. I am also visualizing actual kicks coming at me. I don't want to mindlessly be like, and I just walk around with people doing Santai left, right kicks at me all the time. I actually want to try to feel the, um, in my head, like the relationship between when I see the weight change on someone's kick, like maybe they're going to, if they fake, do I not want to bring my leg all the way up? Like, I don't want to be caught like this because that's Karaha's whole game is he gets you on one leg and then you're screwed. So he wants you to believe that he's kicking you, but really he's just bringing his weight forward. So I want to picture as I'm practicing my blocks, me being sure that I actually need that block, right? So if someone's going to fake me, I can actually fake the block too. like 
mental preparation, I guess. And occasionally, occasionally people are going to throw two on one side. A lot of people in Thailand are very slick with this where they get you to block and then it's actually when your leg comes down that's when they're actually going to kick you. So I try to pay attention to if I block, making sure that when I bring that leg down they haven't already gone. So if they have already gone you can leave it there, you can turn it into a teep or something. I don't know, just play with all the different possibilities I guess. very much and hello Tara thank you that makes me very happy because honestly when I was doing this voiceover today for the patron session I was telling Kevin how much I really enjoyed it like I enjoyed watching it again so I really enjoyed voicing it over because I got to like re-experience it and he's like why so much because Kevin's experience of watching a session and my experience of watching a session are not necessarily the same even though we understand a lot of the same things about Muay Thai but it's the same thing how like the experience of being a fighter in the ring versus even being on the ring at ringside watching versus audience versus on TV, like the farther back you go, you can actually experience a fight completely different. Like your eyes just see it completely different. And I was telling him that one of the reasons I love this session with Crew Thailand so much is that I love the sessions where someone just geeks out on one thing. So like Chan Chai, just showing the teep. We have one of Manop just working with me on the teep. Um, this one where Thailand, <laughs> I walked in and Thailand's like, Today I teach you clinch. I was like, okay, we're just gonna do turns and off balances and the clinch is so cool because you really just like get into the meat of one thing, but it's not, it's not at the expense of other things because you actually end up touching on all kinds of different aspects of balance or strikes or how to set something up in order to just work on this one thing. By like simplifying it, you're actually, um, I don't know dissecting it like you're really just zeroing in and actually getting tons of information out of this small piece instead of like uh, spending too much time on a singular basic thing that you could do in two minutes like you can't do that in two minutes you can actually spend like three hours on the things that he's showing me and I really get into that and so when I think about Muay Thai or when I'm working on techniques or when I'm just <laughs> doing high repetition or like just working on my blocks or something my brain goes to like all the different ways that it connects to all these other things I think that's really exciting. That's what Kevin and my uh, Muay Thai Bones, we have a podcast called Muay Thai Bones, if you're unaware, um, where we just talk about Muay Thai in the way that we talk about Muay Thai all the time, um, but in a slightly more formal setting because we're doing it for people to watch us. Um, but the thing about it that's really exciting is that other people really want to think about Muay Thai in this way too. Like it's not just endless breakdowns or like how do you get the angle on this thing. It's like it's, it's a living, breathing thing and it's in all of us, and the reason we're all so passionate about it is because we feel those aspects of it. And so I think it's really cool to hear from you guys that, that it's um, meaningful and, and um, enjoyable to geek out on things. <laughs> I, love, I love geeking out on small, detailed things, honestly. <laughs> I love
when I was, when Kevin and I were going to move to Thailand, I think, I think it's when we were moving to Thailand, <laughs> we brought everything we owned still that we hadn't gotten rid of to my parents' house in Colorado. And we spent a little time, a few days, training in Colorado, and Sakman Kwon was at this gym, uh, Zingano's Martial Arts, maybe MMA, I don't know. He was at Zingano's gym at the time. And uh, I went and took a couple of classes with him. I had fought on the same card as him like a year before and we got to know him. Um, and he had like a knee problem. He had hurt his knee somehow. And so when he started the class, it was like, I can't demo these things because my knee hurts. And then <laughs> maybe like 20 minutes in, he was totally kicking, like just totally doing everything normal. He was allowing people to kick him in the leg. And someone pointed out, they're like, hey, Mong, your knee is messed up. You're supposed to not be putting weight on it. And he started laughing. And he's like, I forgot. <laughs> And it was this beautiful moment because I've actually experienced this a number of times in Thailand with Thai fighters where like they're hindered by something or something hurts or whatever. Like Pinu does it, he has a bad knee and he's, he can't really kick on one side. And then he'll just be kicking on that side or he'll throw the knee anyway. And it's like they forget that it hurts because they just get so possessed and inspired by the feeling of that movement and how they want to do it. And the reason I thought of this is because my foot was hurting. And so I was like, I'm not going to do the things that make my foot hurt. But here I am doing all kinds of things that my foot is hurting a little bit, but I don't care. Like, I really don't care that it hurts because it feels so good to be doing the other things that I'm doing. And I think it's an important point for me because there are a lot of people who, for very, very good reasons, are like, listen to your body. Um, don't injure yourself. Don't push yourself. If something's hurting, back off of it. I'm not going to argue with these people. I'm just going to argue that those people are telling you what to do. <laughs> so if someone says, I know my body, I'm listening to my body, I'm going to rest, great. That person can do whatever they want to do. But if they're telling you that that's what you have to do, make up your own mind about things. This is Sylvie's take on it, is that the reason I don't listen to my body is because I, I think it's wrong <laughs> a lot of the time. So I think about people who are like climbing Everest. And when you're climbing Everest, you start losing your mind and your body starts breaking down and you just get into this state where you're like, I'm just going to take a nap. Like, I'm just going to lay down for a minute and take a nap. And to me, that's the like, listen to your body. If you need to rest, just go and rest. But your nap becomes a forever nap and you just die on Everest because your body and your mind are like not taking priority kind of thing. So yes, I don't mean to take a super extreme example where like you're going to lay down and die to be like, you need to rest your ankle because you sprained it kind of thing. Like, yeah, back off of it. But the thing about it is people will, like, I'm sore, so I need to rest today. Honestly, if you just start moving around, the soreness goes away. Like, it's, it's actually the laying around is going to make you feel worse than the getting up and moving thing. So right now, what I'm stoked about is that I was talking about how I'm waiting for my body to kind of start getting tired because once I'm fatigued or once the tightness in my hips is real, and I'm able to make it like loose in spite of that. That's what I was focusing on. That's what I was like waiting for is like when the pull-ups start to hurt, then you start counting kind of thing. What I didn't anticipate was that I was just gonna like start really liking <laughs> the feeling of like messing around, just doing like footwork, just bringing those blocks up because I started like visualizing someone trying to mess with me Pinu can get his kick on me anytime he wants. He's so good at waiting for the leg to come down and then nailing me. Karaha is really good at doing the like fake of his weight, which is really good for me because even though I get tagged with it every single time, every time he does it, I get a little bit more information of having seen it so that I can pay attention to someone else's weight who's maybe not as Karaha as Karaha is and someone trying to like fake their weight that way. I know how to deal with that. Like I've got, I've got that teeth handy. Something that Karahat said was that he would work on fakes with people that he was in the gym with every day. And he's like, if I could fake out someone who sees me every single day, I knew I could fake out an opponent who doesn't spend that much time in the ring with me. And I think it's that kind of thing of exposure of like, if I know that I can completely forget that my foot hurts just because I like blocking, then I find that way more valuable to me than, um, listening to my body when my body is telling me to be a jackass. <laughs> it's telling me to like lay down. Sometimes you have to lay down, but most of the time you don't.
My toe is changing color though from the pigs. Other people like the geek out as well. <laughs> That's very good because I cannot help myself. Um, there's a there's a fight. God, I can't actually now remember who it's with. Unfortunately, I'll find it. It's Nam Kabuan, and he and his opponent both go out of the ring. <laughs> Nam Kabuan plows, and they both go out of the ring. And it's possible that the referee goes out also, but I feel like the referee is like lifting the rope for. Nam Kaboon's opponent to like roll back in. And while he's doing this, Nam Kaboon just fucking like jumps over the top rope. Like he just flies back into the ring to start again. It is like, you know how there are movies that are not that great, like, I don't know, Resident Evil or something? Like you don't actually have to speak the language that the movie's in to understand what's going on because one, it doesn't matter, but two, it's like good guy, bad guy, you're good to go. But something in the movie, even though it's like, you know, an all-action movie or something, one small thing, like uh, in, in Terminator 2, Arnie rolling up on his bike and like the way that he pulls up with his shotgun or whatever, you're like, that just totally made the whole movie. Or like in Resident Evil when a helicopter and a motorbike are about to clash or something, like it just it's like becomes the icon of the movie. As exciting as these Muay Thai fights are, as incredible as these entire Muay Thai fights are, that moment of Nam Kabuan as he's jumping back into the ring, like that single thing to me will be like the defining thing of Nam Kabuan. Even though I know him, even though I've spent time with him and there are tons of things to fill that space, that is for me like this quintessential um, sign of Nam Kabuan's particular masculinity that I like so much. And that's the kind of geek out. Like you can find this thing that's like the way that someone rises up on their toe or like the way that. Um, Somrak looks like he's a bag of ferrets and yet is like <laughs> beating people up. Like I swear to God, it's gonna be discovered that Somrak is actually ferrets in an overcoat. Like he's just so like, he has this thing with his arms after he's like moved out of the way, they just kind of like sway. It's like, it's got nothing to do with his strikes. It's not like, oh my God, did you see that right cross? It's actually the stuff between, like it's this weird like gumpiness that he has that, uh, that is so beautiful. So that's again, that's why geek outs are just the best, is that it's like this tiny, tiny thing that like encapsulates everything. It's very, very cool. Um, okay, so that's, that's me done for today. Thank you guys for letting me babble and get super into my <laughs> blocks and elbows. Um, I talked to Yodkun Pan today. He's doing well. He says thank you so much to people who have been sending support to him. Uh, Karahat says thank you. We were able to send some money to Crew Thailand, um, and we... Um, I was contacted by Boon Lai. Boon Lai was really hard to find for the Muay Thai library in the first place. It turns out he was working, teaching Muay Thai at a military camp uh, near where he was born, Cha Chaun Sao. Um, and we went and we found him and we uh, trained with him and put him in the library. He's awesome. He contacted me and said that he was uh, in a bad way because he has not been able to train, he hasn't been able to teach or work for two months. Um, so people are just completely losing their income. Uh, even trainers who had like a somewhat steady stream. Uh, and so we put the call out and people sent money for Boon Lai and we were actually able to replace his two months of uh, income for the two months that he hasn't been able to train. So thank you so much to people who are doing that. That's incredible. Um, it's one thing that I cannot emphasize how important it is and how great it is to be able to financially support these legends and crews who don't necessarily have a safety net or support system when things go awry as they have now. But not only that, but them being supported by the global Muay Thai community, feeling like they're being taken care of, is something that I can't really put into words how meaningful that is for these men who kind of um, 
had notoriety and had fame and are still incredible and still loved but kind of like don't have the floor under them all the time so it's meant a lot um to these legends who we've been able to send money to and kind of take care of them during this time when everyone's struggling and i know it's not easy for everybody so it means a lot for people to be um, sending support at this time. So thank you very much for everyone who's been doing that. Um, if you would like to send any um, money to a crew who's in the Muay Thai library who's inspired you, either through their session or through their fights or just who they are, anything like that, I have an Indiegogo that you can send the money there. But please, please, please do not forget to then send me a message on email or Facebook and let me know who that money is for because it just goes into a pile. Um, and so you need to tell me uh, who it's for so that I know who to direct it to. Um, some people actually have sent money and they're like whoever you think needs it. So <laughs> that's nice too. You can do that as well, but just be sure to send me a note. Um, yeah, it's not as hot, but I totally want to close my windows and turn the aircon back on. Thank you guys for joining me for my at-home workout. I'm going to take one more peek in case I need to answer a question or something like that. Alright, Michelle, a hundred percent. I love when Sarah Connor is reloading the gun with a hurt shoulder. <laughs> I actually super love when she's like carving things on park benches and freaking out because she is like such a neurotic, crazy woman. Also like a insane mother, but then also just like the most badass soldier. Like I love in the first one when she's like grabbing her uh, John Connor's dad, like on your feet, soldiers. Great. I'm going to geek out about Terminator. Okay, see you guys later. Thank you for joining.